So next up, we have a, um, we are going to call um, a friend and colleague here at Blue Marble. Um, Amanda Lind works right in the marketing department here uh, with us. Um, she's a close friend and she's the uh, technical content writer here at Blue Marble. So Amanda is going to be um, joining us today. Amanda, are you there? Hello. Yes, sorry, it took a moment for it to <laughs> unmute me here. <laughs> no worries. It's still early for us here at Humane. It's only 8.36. So Amanda is um, quite knowledgeable. We, we, we depend on her day in and day out here in the marketing department. She's the person who writes all those amazing blogs, the amazing industry showcases that we have. And um, today she's going to be sharing with us uh, walking us through on how to position the optimal uh, flattened site and measuring the effects on terrain using Global Mapper Standard version 25. All right, Amanda, thanks for joining us and please take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, as Sinja said, I'm the technical content writer here at Blue Marble Geographics. So that means I write the software documentation for Global Mapper and Geographic Calculator. That's the knowledge base and the help files, but also the blogs and the workflows that we produce and a lot of the YouTube videos that don't have anyone's faces on them. So it's a lot of fun here. Um, so today for this presentation, I'm going to be going over a workflow that uses new and existing tools in Global Mapper to construct and place a flattened site plan on terrain data. Well, for my example today, that's just going to be an oil pad, but it could be anything. It could be a building, it could be terracing for agriculture, whatever, whatever you need to have completely flat on a terrain layer. And once we have that arranged, we're going to look at how to build a road to it in the most effective manner in terms of slope and uh, mitigating any sort of costs in that nature with the terrain. And then also looking at some of the new watershed modeling, uh, modeling tools that um, Patrick was talking about earlier. So I'm going to start here in the PowerPoint just for a few minutes so we can go over what those tools look like. And then I'm going to jump into the software so you can see how they work and how you can use them in your own workflows. Um, these tools I'm going to go over today can be used, or oh, they're available in Global Mapper version 25, both the standard version and the pro. So everything that's in standard is in pro. So getting started first is the Optimize Flattened Site Plan tool. Now this tool has been around in Global Mapper for quite a while and it's been very popular. And at its essence, it creates the flattened site plan by optimizing the cut and fill values of the soil to even out the landscape into this flat surface using only the soil on site to help mitigate some of the cost of bringing soil in and bringing it out. So it creates not only this little terrain layer here that you can see on top of the other layer, but it also gives you the soil volume measurements. So this is a good way to help plan some of these construction areas without having to go out in the field and do this extra survey. What's new in this tool that we added in version 25 is the ability to find the optimal placement within a specific area. So if you have a little bit of flexibility in how the pad can be arranged or in where it can be placed, we can take advantage of that to find the best place for it to go to minimize the amount of soil movement that needs to be done. And that's very, very useful. It's a very popular tool. Next, the least cost path tool is brand new in Global Mapper version 25. And this is a terrain, um, terrain modeling tool. So it takes a set of point features, a set of locations that you give it, and it creates a past of least cost between all of these points to connect them. And there are a few different ways to do that. We're looking at two of them here, where we have a start point, both of them are green, and other uh, selections of points here. So you can tell Global Mapper that these points have to be collect, connected in a specific order or that you just want them to be connected in the best path possible. So that's what we're, what we're looking at here and what we're going to look at in the software as well. And then last but not least is watershed modeling with the additional vector obstructions. Now watershed modeling is another very popular tool that's been in Global Mapper for a really long time. It works by modeling water flow from cell to cell across the terrain. So if you have a terrain layer made of grid cells, it hypothetically puts it or pretends to put a drop of water on each grid cell and it looks at the surrounding grid cells to find the cells of lowest elevation and then it models the water moving downhill to those lower elevations across the data. So what we're looking at here in this specific screenshot, if you'll bear with me, so this point down here, you can kind of tell with the shading, it's the top of the mountain, and we can see through these catchment areas and the streams, the water flows downhill from there. So you can see 
my mouse keeps disappearing. Here we go. So we can see from this light blue catchment area, all the water flows downstream until eventually enough of it accumulates that it actually turns into a line layer, a little stream as it goes downhill. And that's how the watershed modeling tool works essentially. With the new vector obstructions, you can add vector features, point lines, and area features to the processing so it's taken into account during watershed modeling. So for this example, I've drawn some uh, terraces across the mountain here to kind of redirect the water off to the side. Perhaps this is agricultural, perhaps this is erosion management, but it follows the elevation there. And we can see as the water begins to flow downhill, it's caught by these terraces and redirected to the side of lower elevation and the streams move downhill here. So this is great for mapping waters with curves that you would like to build or buildings or roads or agriculture. It can be used in a variety of different ways. So those are the primary three tools that we're gonna look at here in Global Mapper. Let's go ahead and jump into the software. So I'm starting with flatten site plan here. What I have is a flattened site plan and these two area features where I know I can build this pad in. Maybe I'm limited based on uh, permitting or based on soil structure, but somewhere I want to build that little flight plan, uh, site plan within those two area features at the least amount of soil movement possible. And we'll use Global Mapper to do that, to make that decision and to make those measurements. But before we had the ability to automatically find the best place, we would have to do it manually by placing this uh, feature in different locations and rerunning the tool multiple times to decide that. And maybe one of the ways we could do that is by changing the atlas shader. So instead of displaying this elevation layer by elevation, we could display it by slope. And this would give us the ability to see which areas have the least amount of slope. So I could move my feature around and position it in different locations, run the tool multiple times and collect those numbers and choose the option that's best from there. But thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. We can save ourselves that time by running it automatically. So let's look at what that tool looks like here in the software if I zoom in a little bit. So this, you may notice this as a familiar, it's one of the built-in template site plan tools in Global Mapper, so you should have this on your version as well if you'd like to play around with it. You'll notice that along with my area feature that's selected, I also have some point in line features selected. Now they won't be taken into account during processing because they're not area features, but as the pad is moved to its new location and reoriented, the points in the line features will be moved with it. So that is very handy in itself. So with all of these things selected, I'm gonna grab my digitizer tool here. There are a couple of different ways to get to, these, get to this tool, but I like to right click analysis measurement and choose the option to calculate the satin flattened site plan grid from this selected area. And this brings up one of Global Mapper's dialogues. Now there are a few different options here. One is to calculate, probably the most popular, is to calculate the flattened site that equalizes the cut and the fill volumes. And this just based on the equalization of the volumes is going to give you an elevation to build that pad at. But if you would like, you can also choose to build it at a set elevation. If you know it has to be at a specific elevation, you can't get below the water table or something to that nature, this can help with that as well. Now here's some other settings here that are still existing but still very useful that allow you to cut a slope. So a little bit of a transition zone between the edge of your new elevation and the ground itself. So you can set exactly how much you would like that slope to be steeper, steeper a little bit lower, similarly with benching. Now the new option here is the site placement optimization, this little checkbox to enable it. And this is what tells Global Mapper that you would like it to an analyze the areas to find the best place. So you can choose to search within a specific area from its current location, wherever you've dropped it in your data, or you can limit it based on an area layer. And since I have that area layer loaded, I've named it allowed areas, I'm gonna choose that here. So it's just gonna look between the polygons in that area. There's also a checkbox here to allow rotation of pad site. So if it has to be at a current, a specific orientation, so you need it to have a specific view or something along those lines, you can turn that off and it will maintain its current orientation. Now, if we were going to run this in real life, I'd click okay and it would start generating. But because I only have 20, 25 minutes to run through this, I've gone through, gone ahead just like a baking show and I've processed it ahead of time so we can see what that looks like. And what happens when it finishes is there's a pop-up you'll see with the soil volume measurements, but it also generates two new layers. They're over here grouped in a layer called flatten site plan. So let's zoom over to see what those look like. 
So you can see that it's created a new mesh or a new um, elevation grid layer, and it's also copied and oriented our original vector data layers. So we can zoom out a little bit and we'll see where it's positioned it on the landscape. It's kind of in one of those flat areas that we were looking at with the slope tool. Handy dandy. And we can also see, just by looking at it from this Nader top-down perspective, that it cut a little bit from the top and it filled in a little bit from the bottom. But let's look at it from a few other perspectives so we can really see what that looks like. For starters, I'm going to grab our handy dandy path profile tool, and this lets us take a perpendicular or from the side perspective as to what the data looks like with elevation. So I'll draw a line here. Let me dock this on the bottom here. So we're looking at the data from the side based on where I drew this line. And I've made the background a little gray just so we can see these lines a bit more clearly. So there are two layers loaded here, and both of them are displayed. This blue line here, as we can see in the legend, is the original unedited um, terrain layer. And then the orange layer is our new flattened site plan. So we can see this cut area as it transitioned down to the slope I gave it. I could probably edit that to make it a little smoother, add it, uh, change the different slope values. And then you can see the cut on, and the fill on the bottom and how it made this perfectly flat site plan. We can also look at it in the 3D viewer. And as you may have noticed, I have quite a large layer of elevation loaded for today's demonstration, and I don't necessarily want to display all of that in the 3D viewer at once. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable an option that lets us limit the data that's loaded in the 3D viewer based on what we're looking at in 2D view at the moment. And that's just here in the configuration in Global Mappers, Global Settings here. It's already open. I'm gonna to go to 3D view property, properties, data display, and you can check this box here to mask 3D data by 2D bounds, and that's what it means. It's masking or cropping without actually cropping. It's just what it's visualizing. So go ahead and open our 3D viewer here. It's gonna take a second to tile just because I'm sharing my screen and talking at the same time. My computer always loves that. Okay, let me kick it again. I promise this works when nobody is looking. There we go, that's a little better, all right. So we pivot this and arrange it a little bit so we can see that cut and fill from a 3D perspective. Now you'll notice in comparing this in our heads to the screenshot that we were looking at in the PowerPoint that this looks a little less dramatic. There's a lot less cut and fill going on. And that's because of the calculations that were done to place it at the optimal location so the least amount of earthwork had to be done. So it may be visually less stunning than the last one, but the calculations done are a lot more impressive. And now that we have these two data layers, the vector features with its uh, specific position and elevation and the terrain layer underneath it, we can export it to one of Global Mapper's uh, different file formats. I think we have like 384 or more, probably more since we're about to release a new software. And you can export them as vector or and 3D mesh features, or I keep saying mesh, I mean uh, grid features, DEMs, but you can also create contours if you wanted on connecting this new grid feature with a grid feature underneath it, if that's um, what you need to do. We also have the ability to export 3D data as a 3D PDF. If you would like to send this interactive 3D viewer to somebody who may not be able to have Global Mapper, the 3D PDF will open in your default PDF viewer, and it gives you a, a very limited 3D viewer in that you can kind of pivot it around a little bit and turn layers on and off, and it lets them interact with the data. So that's a great way to share this data that you're creating in Global Mapper with customers and um, get it out in the field to where you want to go. So that's optimal site uh, pad placement. Next, I'm going to look at the creating a least cost path tool. So let me jump back out a little bit so we're looking at more of the data. So what I have here, once I get it zoomed in properly, I have, along with our new flattened site plan that's hanging out over here, I have three tower features. And I'm pretending for this, for this workflow, just for this example workflow, that now that I've constructed that site pad, I would also like to connect a road, bring a road that connects it into those other three points. But I would like to do it similarly to the site plan with the least amount of construction work that needs to be done. Also, for the sake of this example, I'm also going to pretend that the road that enters the data is going to come in over here and end up over by number 14. 
to make things a little more exciting, there's also an area feature here, this little red hatched section. It's an area that we aren't able to build a road through. I'm going to pretend that it's a bog, but maybe it's another permitting restriction. But anyway, the roads that we generate has to avoid that area. So the least cost path analysis tool will take that into account as well. So the first thing I need to do is select the points that I would like to bring into the data set. So I'm going to grab one point to represent our flattened site plan over here. Let me zoom in. And because there are multiple vector types that are thrown in here, so we have a couple of layered area features and line features and point features, to ensure that I only select the point feature, I'm going to hold the P key down on my keyboard as I have the digitizer here, and I can click, and I'm just going to get a point feature. This also works to hold the A key down to select area features and the L key down to select line features. Um, it's especially useful if you're selecting an area feature when you have LiDAR data loaded, so you can just grab the area and not select all the little LiDAR points underneath it. So with that point selected, I'm going to go ahead and select the other three points as well. To do that, I'll hold the control button down on my keyboard. I'll just grab these other three. So I have my four points selected that I would like to create a road between. So next, I'll open the least cost path analysis tool. So it is in our terrain analysis menu. You may have noticed um, if you were using Global Mapper before version 25 that we kind of rearranged how some of our um, menus are. We broke them down a little bit because they were getting a little long into sections based on what kind of data they are used with. So raster analysis, while this grid is technically a raster, raster also includes image analysis. So that helps limit down what these tools can cover as well. Least cost path analysis looks works with terrain data and terrain data only, so we find it in the terrain analysis tool right here. It can take into account any of the elevation data that you have loaded. So when it creates this path, it's also going to look at least cost way to get up onto the flattened site plan that we created earlier. So now that it knows which elevation data, data we'd like to look at, it wants to know what point data we'd like to look at. And because I've selected them earlier, I'm going to choose this option to add selected point features. So it's just going to populate with those four points that I had selected earlier. But of course, it's Global Mapper. You can bring in point layers from loaded data or manually add your point location. You can do just about anything. All right, so as I mentioned earlier in the PowerPoint, there are multiple different ways to tell Global Mapper to connect these points, and those are decided down here in this path order section. So you can choose to start from start to each destination in sequential order, and that order is decided sequential means what order they're listed up here in the top. So you can drag and drop these to rearrange. Let me scoot this to the side so you can see. So we wanted to use number 14 as our beginning. So what I want to do is drag that up to the front. So if I click on it, you can see that it's selected in the workspace. Handy dandy, I'll drag it to the top. And ta-da, now it's our start. The other options are to choose from start to each destination separately, so to create an individual path to each of the other points, or probably the most popular option, most commonly used for what I've heard from customers so far, is from start through each destination at least cost. So it's going to make all of the decisions to create one path through all of these points. But Global Mapper does have an extensive amount of vector editing tools. So if you're looking at truly making the best way to do this best path, you can run each of these individually and kind of select your favorite options from each layer, select them, copy and paste them into a new layer, and kind of create um, create the map that you're really looking for to best suit your needs with your data. Now for this example, I'm going to go choose the option to start from each destination separately. Just because these points are stuck out, it seems to work really well with this data. Now, this next section underneath here is the avoid settings. These are the further limitations you can put into what Global Mapper is going to take into account as it creates these road features. I'm going to check the option to, in addition to avoiding steep slopes that's already built into the tool, I'm going to increase that to avoiding slopes outside of the range of 0 to 20 degrees. So it won't draw the road feature through anything that's steeper than 20 degrees. Um, I chose this because one of our customers who works with mining said that all of his equipment has a high rollover problem with anything steeper than 20 degrees. It makes sense, so that's why I've chosen this number here. But you can also choose the options to avoid elevations below a certain level or above a certain level. So below a certain level would be useful. For example, if I had a point on another side of the river here and a bridge, and I wanted to make sure that it took the bridge instead of trying to make me go through the river, I can say avoid all the elevations below the bridge elevation. And that would help ensure the correct path placement from there. But because we have that bog area feature also loaded, I'm going to choose this option to avoid areas from selected layers. And I've called, I've named that layer avoided areas. 
So I'm going to tell it to navigate around that layer as well. We have a few other standard global mapper settings in here that you can change to help adjust exactly what resolution you would like it to assess your data at. But I'm going to go ahead and click OK so we can create these line features from number 14 to create these roads to each individual points while avoiding the steep slope areas, avoiding our little bog with the shortest road possible. Shouldn't take more than a second here. Aha, here we go. Here are our road features. So let's zoom in and see what that looks like. I'm going to start over here at the site plan pad. And we can see, because it took this new terrain layer into account, that as it brought the line layer in, it brought it in through one of the flatter areas. So you don't have, it, it isn't asking you to do any additional earthwork to get the road up exactly to the pad layer as it is. But of course, you can put point features exactly to which part of the pad you would like to do and help guide it that way as well. And then we can see with the avoided area, if I zoom in here, that it has also completely avoided this area as well. This is where, if you want it to be farther away, this is where the buffer tool would also be useful. Where is that? It's over here. For creating an, an additional area feature around that to help push it farther away, if that's what you are looking for in creating your roads. And now that these roads exist as line features, you could send them, for example, to Global Mapper Mobile. You could export these um, out to your out to your crews in the field, so they would be able to take these location this this data out as into the field as they work with them, but also to another one of the 380 some odd different file types as well. So that's least cost path analysis. Next, we can look at watershed analysis. I'm going to focus on just a small area here. Just for the most dramatic effect, I'm going to choose this little hill here where the road comes at the bottom. And now that we have this road feature and it's going to cut across the bottom of the hill, maybe we're interested in how that's going to affect how the water flows down the hill across the road. Is it going to cause erosion? Is it going to channel the water all into one place? It's going to cause a little bit of an issue with um, excuse me, erosion as well. Maybe we need to build a culvert, but the watershed analysis tool can help us determine that. And that tool is up here. It's this little mountain with a water drop on top of it. And this opens our standard watershed generation options. Now, a lot of these settings are exactly the same. They're very familiar. Um, if you would like a definition for all of these individual settings, you can always find them either in the knowledge base or up here in the help menu. But I'm very happy to answer any and all questions that you have. So the new option down here the new section is obstructions from vector data. And this is where you can tell Global Mapper which vector loaded vector layers you would like to use and take into account during your processing and how you would like to use them. So I'm gonna check this box to enable that option to tell it to take these vector features into account. And then there are a few further settings as well. So you could tell it to only consider vector features with elevations. These vector features don't have to have elevations to be accounted for. I don't think these least cost path uh, vector features do, but you can if you have that option, especially if the vector features are a little bit higher off the ground and they're touching the ground in some places, this setting would be great to take that into account with your data. You can also check the option that obstruction features always block flow. If you have a bunch of houses, they're always gonna block the flow. <laughs> so you could use that option here for that, or you could, Tell it that the heights of vector features are relative to ground. So it's going to assign the elevation of the vector feature to the height above ground. So if it's on the ground, that will be zero. Then this next section down here just lets you choose which areas to use. But because I'm focusing on a small area, I'm just going to make sure that least cost path is chosen. So what I'm going to do for this example is I'm going to run this tool twice. One using the vector features and taking them into account, and one um, without. So we can compare what those outputs look like. So first, I'm going to label this factor so we can tell the difference between them because this road, this is taking the road features into account. And to prevent it from running across the whole data set, I'm going to use the watershed bound options to draw a box to limit the processing spatially here. So I'm going to grab this road and then I'm going to grab a little bit of the hill above it so we can see how the water flows downhill and how that's affected by the road. So I'll click OK, OK, lickety split. It's generated some of our stream layer here. And then I'm going to run that one more time. I'm going to call this no vector because we're not using vector. If I can talk and type at the same time, and then I'm going to set the same watershed bounds here, more or less. And there we go. So first I'm going to turn off 
vector so we can look at no vector and what this looks like at the road. Zoom in a little bit. With the terrain loaded underneath it, it is a little bit difficult to see the lines. So I'm going to just turn up the transparency of this gridded elevation layer so we can see the lines more quickly. I'm going to do that by opening vector options for this layer from the right click menu or from double clicking on it. And then this display tab is a uh, general transparency. So this is going to make the whole layer a little bit more transparent so you'll be able to see that plain white global mapper beneath it. So I'll click apply. So we can still see all the elevation layer underneath it, but the streams are certainly a little bit more difficult to stand out. And as we expected with this watershed layer that was not taking the roads into account, we can see that the streams flow straight downhill, straight through that road. But what does that look like with the roads? Let me switch these layers around so we can see what the vectors are. And we can see as the streams flow downhill, they in places intersect with this road and they flow down to the lowest point and they tend to um, accumulate here in different locations. So those are going to be the areas that may need some culvert underneath the road or may need some um, ditches to be built and some other erosion mitigation to help prevent washouts and other issues that typically come with erosion. Now I have a few extra minutes here. One of the ways that we can model how um, how culverts and some of these erosion mitigation practices can be done in Global Mapper is using the Terrain Paint tool. Now, this is a version or two old, but what this tool does is it lets you paint instead of with color, but with elevation values in your elevation data. This is a really popular tool, probably because it's so much fun to use. You may have seen it before, but honestly, it's one of my favorites. There are a few different options here for how you can change those elevation layers as you're painting across the top. You can choose to interpolate to fill holes in your data. So it's going to, if you have a hole in your layer, it will look at the surrounding values to take an ed a very educated guess as to what data should be filled with that hole. You can choose to smooth terrain to average it across. For example, if you have LIDAR data of a forest and you've uh, taken all the vegetation out of the forest, you just have the ground and you've created a solid surface from there, Quite frequently, those solid surfaces tend to be a little more rough just because we have a few more rocks and things that transition between the vegetation and the ground. So the smooth terrain average option can help smooth that out. We also have some filters that can be used for that particular purpose as well. You can choose to raise or lower the terrain height by a specific elevation, specific um, measurement, but if you know that you want to have a specific building or a dam that's 20 feet above current height, you can choose that option here. You can set it to a specific terrain height or a specific elevation, or you can choose to slope along or across lines. So if you know that you want to build a, uh, a road down the side of a mine that's a specific slope, this is a great way to model that within your data. Of course, you can create your own holes by setting it to no data, and then characteristic global mapper, we have revert to original heights or undo. You can undo just about anything. But for this particular workflow, I'm gonna to choose to lower the terrain height. What I want to do is build a culvert on this side of the road that's going to catch the water in its little dip, so a little dip section. I guess it wouldn't be a culvert, it's a ditch. Build a little ditch <laughs> into the elevation data. So as the water runs down the hill, it'll hit that ditch and be diverted before it gets to the road. And then perhaps you can take a culvert and manage where that water flows downhill from there without causing any disruption to your road. So I've chosen the brush type line feature so I can draw that ditch as a line, but also included in this tool, so they don't have the, uh, the ditch loaded, you could choose to paint using selected features. So for example, if you had this road layer and you knew that you wanted to build a ditch on either side, you could use, again, the buffer tool to create those lines on a specific um, distance from either side of the road, and then you could use those line features to, cre to create the ditch. These sections down here let you determine exactly what the new height is. So I'm gonna say that I want it to be two meters lower. Brush size, so that's how wide it is. I'm gonna say that I, I want it to be one meter. And then feathering, that's the transition zone again. Also what we were looking at kind of with cut and fill. So this is, if I set it to zero meters, it's gonna be a, a sheer wall, a 90 degree wall. But I want it to take two meters to transition from the lowest point of the ditch back up to the elevation data of the, the rest of the layer. So that's what that setting is. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw this line feature, zoom in a little bit. So you can see on my mouse here that there are two different circles. So the red circle is the height 
So that is the two meters that I'm setting. And then the larger blue circle is the feathering distance. So you can visually take that into account as well. So I'm just going to draw this along, zoom out a little bit, draw it along the sign feature. Click, and then maybe I can pretend that there's a culvert here on the bottom. I'll left click to end, and we can see that there's now a ditch in the data. So I can grab the path profile tool. Once again, so we can take a perpendicular perspective of what it looks like in the data. And we can see that there is now a little ditch in the road. Maybe you'd want it to be a little bit deeper, probably a little bit deeper to really work with the road. But that's how you can help give examples of these uh, mitigation practices for erosion in working with your data in Global Mapper. That's just about all I have for today. Let me go back to my PowerPoint here. Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for that great demonstration. It was exciting to see some of the new features from version 25 in action. So we've got Absolutely. some questions. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so we've got some questions coming in. Um, the first one is, what is the best resolution to use for the site pad placement tool? Oh, that's a common question we get when working with, with elevation data is questions at what is the best resolution to use. And resolution is, for those of you who are new, it's the size of the this, of this, uh, grid cells in your data. If you have very large grid cells, since each grid cell only has one value, that one value is going to represent a lot of ground underneath it. So if you have, as you can imagine, smaller grid cells, a higher resolution, then you're going to have more accurate data. There really isn't a solid answer to that question. I wish I had one for you. but of course, the higher data resolution, the better, but it depends on how exact you want to be with your workflow, and it also depends on what you want to, um, exactly how specific you need to be with your data. With awesome. Your Thank you. Um, the other question I found was, does the watershed mapping tool take rainfall amounts into account? It does not. It is, is so far at this point in time, we're always improving our software. It just looks at how the water flows across the landscape, how it flows from cell to cell. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, Happy thank you, Amanda. We, we learned a great deal, at least I did. <laughs> thank you for joining us.